Hello, I'm Tony Anadio, and in this lecture, I'd like to look at a few ideas in the art of the Renaissance compared to the Middle Ages, and also to explore how art came about. That would be what we call patronage. Uh, but first, some background on the Renaissance itself. The Renaissance follows the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages are sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages, even though as we've seen, the Dark Ages really wasn't all that dark. And particularly in the monasteries, where you have these monks transcribing books, you have an awful lot of knowledge. And what had happened is that if you wanted to know something that was in those books, you went to a monastery and studied them, and maybe you could talk with the monks or other people. And what had happened over time is that these monks realized that there would be a certain, there should be a certain order to reading the books. And so they developed a kind of curriculum, you might say. And then people would follow those, that curriculum, and eventually those studies turned into degrees, the monasteries turned into schools, and then into universities. But the monasteries themselves, in terms of, of their contributions, were sort of repositories of Greco-Roman knowledge. So they would tr literally transcribe anything. It isn't just that they're doing the Bible, they did, but any work from the classical period of ancient Greece and Rome, they would transcribe. So they had all of that knowledge. So this Greco-Roman knowledge and appreciation for Greco-Roman knowledge had already been there prior to 1350. So this, the, the term Renaissance means a rebirth, and what we really mean is a rebirth of Greco-Roman culture. So it isn't just that at the end of this wave of Black Death, which begins in 1347 um, and ends sort of in 1350 where, you know, it's estimated a third to a half of the population of Europe is wiped out. Um, it's, it, it's not as if it just sort of suddenly happened at that moment. So the ideas had been there for a while. Um, but when you have that kind of devastation, of losing that much of a population in so short a time, people naturally wonder, why is this happening? How is this happening? How can we stop it? And they naturally look to authorities, such as the church or state, but they had no answers, and they couldn't stop it. So people began to then question the authority of those institutions of the church and state, which partly leads to the ideas we will see in the Renaissance. But there were also some benefits to the Black Death. Prior to this, if there were famines, and that happened, you know, with some regularity, you know, people could be weakened, they'd be more susceptible to disease, but if there, were, if there wasn't a lot of food around and then suddenly a bunch of people died, well, then there's a lot more food for the people who did survive. There's also more opportunity in terms of jobs. You have um, all of these tradespeople were indiscriminate. The, the disease was very indiscriminate. And with a lot of people dying, there was a great need for labor. So people who are still on <clears throat> in the manorial system or the feudal system, serfs, they could leave and just go to these cities or these other places and find work. So there were those benefits, and there's also, prior to the Black Death, there was an increase in the amount of trade. There's rising standards of living, and then following the Black Death, if you survived it, then you, know, you had some immunity to the disease itself. So a lot of this stuff starts to happen uh, around the same time. And these ideas from the Greco-Roman period against the, the time of the Black Death and the aftermath, people began to think about life a little bit differently. 
If we overgeneralize and think of the Middle Ages as where life is very nasty, brutish, and short, and that your life, no matter how hard it was, didn't really matter, because if you are religious, you will go to the afterlife and enjoy eternity in heaven, so don't worry too much about this life, don't worry about your body, those things don't matter. But in the Renaissance, this emphasis on, or this, in these increasing standards of living led to a renewed emphasis on the human body, on living this life. Standards of living are improving, people are living longer. So those ideas are sometimes thought of with this word known as humanism. And um, it's a very complex topic. It isn't something you can just very easily define because it's a lot of different ideas about a lot of different things. But if we overgeneralize here as well, we can think of humanism as you know, a set of ideas about living this life. People still want to go to heaven. It's still the most important thing in their lives. But in the meantime, they want to enjoy this life. So humanism was a set of ideas sort of devoted to, to that purpose. But intellectually, people wanted to understand those texts in their originals. There was a term called ad fonts, to the sources. They didn't want to read what people thought of those sources in the Middle Ages. They wanted to read the original sources. And of course, those were available in the monasteries. So you have this emphasis on education, you have an emphasis on the human body, and a desire to enjoy life a little bit. But some of those Greco-Roman ideals that re-emerged into the, in the Renaissance were things that we call the heroic ideal and the cult of beauty. The Greeks did not call them that, but as we study the period, that's, those are the terms that we've assigned to them. So the heroic ideal is this notion of a person being strong and brave and beautiful and talented and smart, competitive and favored by the gods. And the cult of beauty was to sort of understand the mathematics of relationships and what would be the most aesthetically appealing. And those ideas kind of come back. In other words, they're, they're, there's a renewed emphasis on them. Additionally, when we look at the rise of the state, particularly after Charlemagne. Charlemagne amasses this very large empire, and around him grows this courtly culture of his you know, trusted friends and their companions and so on. And as those standards increase, they begin to enjoy things like banqueting and music. And then there's the Crusades, and we have the age of chivalry. And so what happens is that there's this renewed appreciation for women. There's an emphasis on emotion. So we start to see more women in art. And it's around this time that the Virgin Mary becomes a central figure of Christianity. I mean, that might sound a little odd to modern ears because the Virgin Mary is so central to Christianity. But for a long time, in the early Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, Mary was just a minor person. But with this emergence of courtly culture, this emphasis on emotion and appreciation of women, Mary becomes this central figure. It's known as the cult of the virgin or the Marian cult. And so we see that happening in the, in the Middle Ages as well. And of course, that bleeds into the Renaissance. But when we looked at the age of cathedral building, all of those cathedrals are known as Notre Dames. I mean, the most famous cathedral, Notre Dame, is the cathedral Notre Dame de Paris. And because Paris is the capital of France, it sort of got the moniker, no, when we say Notre Dame, that's the one we mean. But all of the cathedrals at Amiens, at uh, Beauvais, Reims, Chartres, they're all Notre Dames. And it's a phrase that simply means Our Lady, and Our Lady was the Virgin Mary. And in those cathedrals, we see stained glass windows. And those stained glass windows represent art. They're depictions of Jesus and Mary, stories from the Bible and so on. But then, as now, those windows were very expensive. And in order to defray the cost, the church would allow groups of people to sponsor windows. And this would usually be a guild of 
carpenters or blacksmiths or knights or bankers or what have you, and they would pool together the money, they would sponsor the window, and then they would get to appear in the window. So there would be some, you know, image, some religious image, and then in the lower part of the window you would see people plying the trade of whoever sponsored the window. So these are a sort of a way to bring the community in um, and also to emphasize the importance of work, one of the ideas that we can look at. But what we see with this trade, with the increase in trade is people are making a lot more money. And when people make more money than they need to just meet their basic needs, then they spend things on art, things like that, fashion and better clothing and homes and things of that nature. So there's now an art market. There starts to become art starts to become a profession. And when people do art, it's not like today. People today make art, they sell art. Back then, art had to be commissioned. In other words, nobody really did art until somebody said, here's some money, here's what I want you to do. This is known as commissioning a work of art or art patronage. When a person commissions art, then they're going to have a say in what that art is. Particularly because artists aren't, again, today artists are celebrities. Back then, they weren't, and especially in the early Middle Age, or the early Renaissance, late Middle Ages, most of, a lot of these artists were not even really known. It's really the Renaissance where we start to see not only art as a profession, but also the artist as a celebrity. That's really where it gets its start. But the person who is commissioning the art is going to have a lot of say in what that art's going to look like. You know, the old saying, uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And particularly if they want that art to be of them, they're going to have a, a lot of say in what it really looks like and how they're presented. So if we look at how those patrons paid for art, a lot of these pictures are known as donor portraits. Whereas somebody would commission an artist they would want some particular scene from the Bible, adoration of the Magi, the Annunciation, or something like that. And they would have the artist paint them in the scene. So you would see the scene, and a lot of times it would be set in a sort of modern setting. Um, but they would be in it. Now, it's not like they were going to fool anybody to thinking that they were actually at the birth of Jesus, but it sort of connects them to something that people universally had regarded as, as holy and significant. But there's a little bit more to this than that. If you were going to have your picture taken, you know, school day, you, your mom makes you dress up and wear your nicest clothes, which you can't stand, you know, and it's, a way to present your best face to the world. Um, it's no different here. If you're going to have your portrait painted, then you want to be painted in your sort of finery, or you might want to be painted in such a way to convey a message to somebody. And you have to have the money to do it. So one of the families who had that money were the famous Medici family. They initially uh, were medics, who became woolen merchants and then got into banking where they could make a lot more money. They eventually become bankers to the Pope. But as they sort of cement their position in Florence um, in the early Renaissance, they would make loans to poorer people that they pretty much knew they weren't going to get paid back or they would allow them to pay with chickens or furs or wool or you know, just stuff, you know. They basically wrote off the money. But if you do that, it's one way to get their support. Bankers want to make money, and back then you couldn't really make money in the art market. There really wasn't an art market, to, especially how it exists today. So commissioning art wasn't really economically a smart thing to do. But if you could commission these donor portraits, then you could 
pr present yourself to the public in such a way that increased your prestige and your status. So we start to see a lot of these um, very wealthy families um, with these donor portraits and so on as a way to sort of cement their holiness, you might say, and their position in the church. But then you have to look at how these artists are trained. So one of the Medicis, Lorenzo the Magnificent, establishes the first art academy. Now, mostly artists were trained by other artists. You would be an apprentice and then you could do your own work. But Lorenzo wanted to more systematize this. So he establishes an art academy and actually discovers Michelangelo as a young boy, brings him into his home, raises him alongside his own sons. Um, so now art is starting to become a lot more formalized. There's more rules governing how it should be done. There's technology and how paints are made and how canvases or wood is prepared for paintings and, and so on. And as more people begin to make more money and more artists elevate their talent levels, and especially with the study of anatomy, the, the appreciation for the Greco-Roman heroic ideal cult of beauty, you know, this is where we start to see art as we know it today uh, flourish. So these patrons of art, they have a particular desire to uh, present themselves uh, in a certain way. So for example, you can look at the Pope Alexander VI. In this painting of him, he appears to be very pious, very humble. He is in prayer. Um, his real name is Rodrigo Borgia, and he is the patriarch of the notorious Borgia family. He had many children, and when he became Pope, one of the events he uh, sponsors was known as the Banquet of the Chestnuts. It was this lavish banquet in which all of the cardinals and popes and courtiers are feasting and after dinner is done, um, they put out these candles on the floor and they throw out all these chestnuts. And then 50 nude prostitutes slithered around the floor to see how many they could pick up. I will leave it to your imagination how they picked up those chestnuts. Following that, there was an orgy in which records were kept of who could do it the most times with the most different people. And, you know, and this is the Pope, mind you. But you don't see that in this painting of Alexander VI because he's not going to paint the banquet of the chestnuts and put that on the walls of the Vatican. So see what I'm really doing behind the scenes. So there's always a, uh, a desire to portray oneself a certain way. You can look at Julius II, the ultimate Renaissance Pope. In this painting by Raphael, he appears very grandfatherly or avuncular, like he's your uncle. He almost looks a little sad and humble and so on. Uh, but he's also known as the warrior pope. Not only did he lead the papal armies as a cardinal, but he actually led them into battle two times as the pope. I mean, this just defies explanation. Of course, in this painting, you don't see that at all. Of course, that's not really what he wants people to see. Or his successor, Leo X, the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent, a man who had grown up with phenomenal wealth. Um, when he becomes pope, he turns to his cousin and says, God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. And they proceed to party for a couple of years and nearly bankrupt the papal treasury at a time when, as Julius II had ordered the reconstruction of St. Peter's Cathedral, which required an awful lot of money to turn this, you know, a basilica from the age of Constantine a thousand years earlier into the opulent, you know, Vatican that it is today. Um, it costs a lot of money to do that. And of course, that in itself is making a very public statement about, you know, what Christianity was. So they nearly bankrupt the papacy um, after two years of partying. And of course, you're not going to see that in this painting. He looks very serious very sober, you know, he's not the kind of guy who's going to do those sorts of things. But of course, 
that's not what he wants you to see. So we can look at how those people wanted to be seen, but then we can look at some ideas in art. You know, because art, in many instances, especially in these churches, is for public consumption. So the church wanted to convey certain messages. And one of the most important ideas they want to convey is the notion of salvation. When we look at the, the cathedrals of the Middle Ages, when you walked into the building, it was supposed to give you that sense of walking into heaven, a sense of salvation. But during the Renaissance, we start to see that in painting. So those paintings are often called the Last Judgment. One of the most famous examples is, of course, the one by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, in which you can clearly see the virtues of going to heaven versus the dangers of going to hell and what it would be like to go there. So you wanted to make sure that you were going to be a good person. So those are two totally different ways to convey the same idea of salvation with a, with a building and then with a visual painting where you can actually see it. In the Middle Ages, we, the, the whole feudal system is kept together with the notion of loyalty. And even outside the feudal system, the notion of loyalty is very important. So, you know, we'll see that in paintings as well, this, these ideas of loyalty, how people are supposedly, so, are supposed to be devoted. You see this in religious paintings, you know, that are supposed to instill emotions of piety and devotion and adoration and, and things like that. You also see depictions of sin. And even though where there's an emphasis on women and appreciation of women, a desire to portray them beautifully, Generally, when we see sin in art, it usually is a woman. We'll see Eve tempting Adam, or we'll see Mary Magdalene, the fallen woman, as most people think. Things like that. There are, there's an evolution in how the Virgin Mary is depicted. You know, first, it's just, she's just depicted as a woman. You know, any female would do. But by the Renaissance, she's depicted very beautifully. And same with Jesus. I mean, we don't know what Jesus looked like. But most people have in mind this guy with really long hair and a beard who's very muscular, very physically fit. Um, and of course, that is a real Renaissance view, a European view of what Jesus might have looked like. But those images of Jesus change as well. But people study anatomy like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Albrecht Durer, they're studying perspective, they're trying to make these paintings look a lot more realistic. But even looking at something like Jesus and how he is depicted, you can look at Raphael's Christ on the Cross with the Angels and Saints. And it's a beautiful Italian landscape. Jesus looks very physically fit. It's very beautiful and serene. Christ died for our sins versus Matthias Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece in which the background is black, everybody is crying, Jesus' body is drawn out, there's blood everywhere. It's a horrible crucifixion. It's an execution. He was executed by the Romans and the Jews. So that was the sort of message that we see in the North. Of course, the North had as its tradition, you know, they've come out of the world of Beowulf, whereas the Italians come out of the Roman Empire, La Dolce Vita. So you can see very, very different mindsets, even with the exact same subject of the crucifixion. There's the notion of humanism in painting as well. But one example that is one of the most famous is called the tribute money. And there's some scholarly debate as to whether this is actually what it meant. But this painting by Masaccio, uh, known as the tribute money, reflects this biblical story where the tax man comes up to Jesus, wants his money. Jesus instructs Peter to go down to the shore of the lake and he will find a fish and in the fish's mouth is coins that he can pay the tax man. And in this painting, we can see that scene playing out. Of course, there's perspective in this painting. All of the perspective lines actually centered in Jesus. He's the vanishing point. But this is on the, the wall of a, of a church, and in, at the same time that this is painted, there is a tax being levied on 
the people of Florence, known as a catasto. And the message is, I guess, fairly clear. Jesus paid his taxes. You better pay your taxes. Now, there's some debate, as I said, about that. But it's probably not that coincidental that that's the message of the painting. So in a sense, it's a way of showing people how to live. One of Jesus' sayings was, render unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So these are just a few of the ideas that we see in the art of the Renaissance compared to the art of the Middle Ages and the sort of notion of who gets to commission the art and what they want to look like. But of course, when the, Ren when the Reformation comes along, um, it's not that the, the Northerners reject art at all, but they don't want art in churches because they take the Bible literally. In other words, the notion of humanism for the Northerners was one of, you know, add fonts to the sources, thou shalt not worship graven images. So in those Northern Protestant churches, there wasn't any art because they saw it as sacrilegious. And of course, humanism for them, for them, the same ideas, this is the same Renaissance, but for them, they wanted to live this life by reforming this life, by finding what was wrong with it and fixing it. Whereas in Southern Italy, it was a bit more about enjoying this life, la dolce vita. But as they said, again, they come out of two different cultures. And that really underscores just how important culture is. And even to this day, you know, a, people in Southern Europe, you know, behave in many ways very differently than, than in Northern Europe. And that all goes back to culture. And it is one of the reasons why art is so important and understanding the ideas in art is so important, as well as who's commissioning it and when it's being done. Thanks for listening.